Good evening. My name is Henry Stein, and I'm with Beacon Orthopedics. And what I'm going to do tonight is talk about stem cells and PRP uh, to be used in the treatment of osteoarthritis and other musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, what I will do is I will leave time for questions at the end of the at the end of the discussion, uh, so we can have some interaction here so that we we can get your questions answered. So first of all, what is regenerative medicine? Right now, there's a lot going on in orthopedics and musculoskeletal medicine, uh, talking about how to treat patients conservatively uh, for arthritis, for tendon injuries, for ligament injuries, and understanding sometimes conservative treat treatment surgically is the best treatment. For instance, if you fall out of a tree and break your arm, uh, you're not going to want a stem cell treatment. You're going to want a surgical repair to put the bone back in place. But on the other hand, for, for many things that involve wear and tear over a period of time that have traditionally been treated with surgery, uh, that is no longer the case all the time. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay. So first, we're going to have a little discussion about osteoarthritis. And osteoarthritis, basically what that is, it is a loss of cartilage uh, that is attached to the end of our bones. In other words, we have cartilage on the end of our bone identical to what you see when you break your chicken leg and thigh apart, the yellow gristly material. And that wears off much like paint flaking off a ceiling over a period of time. Other times it can be a little bit more dramatic, like a chunk of plaster falling out of the ceiling and there's a definite change in how the joint feels. Now, this can be due to a previous injury. It can be due to normal wear and tear. Uh, gene genetics will sometimes play a role, or many times it's a combination of everything. So one reason osteoarthritis develops is due to the loss of homeostasis or the normal environment inside a joint or tissue. <clears throat> so looking at these three pictures here, they just show the various stages of osteoarthritis. The pink material that you see here, that is one of our bones. You can see it's attached to the end of the thigh bone. It's also attached to the end of the This is just another picture here depicting the cartilage loss on various parts of the bone. In other words, osteoarthritis does not have to affect the entire joint. Um, it can sometimes affect the inside part of the joint, uh, sometimes the top of the joint, sometimes the back of the joint, and this is just showing osteoarthritis in a knee, uh, but it can progress in various stages in all of our joints. Okay, and again, we talked a little bit about homeostasis. In other words, our body, our joints are always repairing, remodeling, recycling themselves, just like our skin will turn itself over completely in about a week or so. Every blood cell we have in our body, brand new in about three weeks, and our joints do the same thing. Um, and again, it's much like an ecosystem in order for a plant to grow. It has to have the correct amount of water, sun, wind, temperature and soil, and that's how things grow, and our body does the same thing. Uh, that is the natural balance inside our body, whether it's a tendon, ligament, muscle, an internal organ like a heart or a kidney, body has to repair itself, and, and some tissues have higher regenerative capacities than others. For instance, a muscle tissue or skin or blood cells, they repair and replace themselves much more readily than nerve tissue does, and once this uh, this rough, this balance breaks down, that's when we start to get problems. So if you look at this flower bed here, <clears throat> excuse me, these are in patients, and some in patients grow well in the sun, but most do best in the shade. So if you look at this flower bed here, these plants are all getting the same soil. They've been fed the same way. Uh, they're getting the same amount of wind, but something is different here that when you look at this group here, there they've kind of died out and wilted. And if you look, there's an area here where sun can come in during hot part of the day where those group of flowers that get the direct sunlight don't do as well because it's too much. Every plant needs sunlight, but some grow in the shade, some grow in the sun, some sweat all the time, others do great in dry soil. But the point being is uh, our, our body does the same thing. So if we look at a 
picture of a joint here. Again, this is just showing me as an example. We don't have blood inside our joints. We have a, a fluid called a synovial fluid, and the joint is a sealed space, and inside that is where we have the joint fluid and the cartilage on the end of the bone is exposed to the joint fluid, as are the menisci, the, the cartilage, the other ligaments. Um, well, sometimes inside the joint, but sometimes the ligaments are outside the joint. So what this shows here, and again, I show this slide always to our medical students and residents, so they have to know the names of all these substances. You don't. But basically what happens when, it, when, when we develop arthritis is the joint is no longer producing the protein, enzymes, and molecules that repair, remodel, and recycle. And they're mainly producing these substances. Here you see on the box on the right to cause pain, cause inflammation, and cause the joint to break, the cartilage to break down inside the joint. And these substances will also break tendons down. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And we'll come back to this slide later when we talk about the essence of how PRP and stem cells work. Okay. This is a picture here of knee osteoarthritis. So if we look at the x ray over here, these are normal knees. The outside here is called the lateral compartment, and the inside is called the medial compartment. And normally you see this space between the bones because the x ray beam will go through the meniscus, which is the cushion that sits between the bone, and it will also go through the cartilage that's attached to the end of the bone. So as the cartilage wears down, you see here where it appears that one bone is sitting on top of the other. And understand, and, and people ask this all the time, well, if I have bone on bone, how come my joint can move? Understand, if you, if I, if you go back to the slide I just showed you, we have synovial fluid inside our joint. So even though you take an x-ray, it appears those two bones are sitting on top of each other. There is actually a, a fluid would interface between the two jo the two bones that even with osteoarthritis, unless it's really end stage, still allows the bones to move across each other. So it's not dry like you know two pieces of wood rubbing across each other. And again, looking at different parts of the knee, it, it basically has three compartments. The inside part here, this is the medial compartment. This is where your knees touch each other. This this X-ray beam here is if you're looking down at your knee, this this is the thigh bone and this is the kneecap. And this is the groove here that the kneecap sits in. And you can see that there is osteoarthritic changes here where this part of the kneecap is touching the thigh bone, but you have plenty of space here between the two bones. And this picture here shows osteoarthritis on the outside part or the lateral compartment of the knee. And it's important to know what part of the knee is affected by the osteoarthritis because not all parts of the knee or a hip or a shoulder, whatever joint is being treated, respond the same uh, to biologics, respond even the same to surgery. Okay? Here's a picture of a hip joint. Now, the hip joint is a ball and socket joint. This is the ball and this is the socket in the hip. I showed you pictures of the knee, which is a hinge joint that moves back and forth, like the name says, a hinge. So, again, here we see, again, this is cut off here. You don't see the capsule that holds the bones together. You see a little bit of it here. But in the space between the ball and the socket, there is still fluid in there, but the protective cartilage has worn off. And in the hip, there's a cushion that sits between the ball and the socket. That's called a labrum. And we also have that in our shoulder joint or any ball and socket joint, where when you have a hinge joint, the, 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 the cushion between that is called a meniscus. And this is osteoarthritis of the hip. This is a normal looking hip here. Again, there's the ball, here's the socket. And you can see that gray line, which represents the cartilage that is still there on the end of the bone. And when you look over here at an arthritic hip, that joint space is, is, is become obscured. You see the bone is much whiter in color, and I mean W-H-I-T-E-R, not whiter. And that is called sclerosis, and that's part of what you see on x-ray with osteoarthritis. This is looking at the shoulder joint. The humeral head is nice and round like this here. You see the normal joint space. Again, cartilage on the end of the bone, which allows the x-ray beam to go through. And as the osteoarthritis progresses, you'll see here big bone spur here, medical term for a bone spur is called an osteophyte. You see the shape of the, the humeral head has changed somewhat. 
and you see this, this space between the two bones is, 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 is not there because the cartilage has worn off the end of the bone. So different joints respond differently to osteoarthritis. In other words, as osteoarthritis progresses, in addition to the cartilage wearing off the end of the bone, the fibrocartilage between the bone also wears away. That fibrocartilage in a, in a knee joint is called a meniscus. The fibrocartilage in a shoulder joint or a hip joint is called a labrum. And they, they will wear away. So oftentimes, uh, people that have a moderate amount of osteoarthritis will twist their knee, they'll get an MRI scan, and oh boy, there's a meniscal tear. Well, you cannot have a significant amount of osteoarthritis your arthritis in a knee joint and have a normal meniscus because part of the problem is that as the osteoarthritis progresses, it's taken down the meniscus with it. And the thinking had always been, well, gee, there's that meniscal tear. That must be the source of the pain. But for a lot of years, not many people consider that maybe the pain is actually coming from the osteoarthritis. And what has been shown over the years that if you take that meniscus out in someone that has osteoarthritis, you are definitely shortening the time until you get a joint replacement. The other thing that happens in a knee, the ligaments that hold the bones together become like a rubber band that doesn't snap back in place, so that leads to an unstable joint. Now, a hip joint acts completely differently. The connective tissue that holds the joint together, called the capsule, it tends to stiffen up, so people that have uh, advanced hip osteoarthritis, they have problems with the simple things like putting their socks and shoes on because they can't move the joint enough to bring their knee and their foot up closer to their arms so they can perform that uh, daily action. So again, looking at a meniscus here, uh, the meniscus is a cushion that sits between the bone. And it's this C-shaped structure here. Part of the meniscus has a blood supply called the red zone. It is like the red part of your fingernail. If that gets injured because there is a blood supply to it, it has a very, very good chance of healing. The inner part of the meniscus here called the white zone, that is much like the white part of your fingernail, where if you ever get a, you know, caught your fingernail on something and you look, it's torn, you snip that little piece out. And up until we used biologics, we didn't think there was a way to actually get that meniscus to heal. But that has changed a lot over the last year, where we, in the last number of years, where we actually see meniscal tears healing. Now, meniscus, a meniscus or menisci plural, can tear in a lot of different ways. You can have a longitudinal tear that goes on the plane here. You can have this little oblique tear where you got this little fragment here, and you can tear it in this direction here. So there's a lot of different ways that you can tear a meniscus. Not every meniscal tear. Uh, behaves the same way. Medial meniscus tears tend to be a lot more forgiving than lateral meniscus tears just because they're constructed differently. So uh, <clears throat> understand that when you get meniscal tears, you can get them without osteoarthritis. That's when you take a 25-year-old who's out in the backyard playing basketball or a soccer, plants their knee, turns, feels a pop, they tear the meniscus. That can happen without osteoarthritis, but when you have advanced osteoarthritis in your knee, the meniscus where you have the osteoarthritis is never going to be normal. Then the two of those go together. Okay? So again, you can tear a meniscus without having osteoarthritis, but if you have advanced osteoarthritis, the meniscus just between those two bones is never normal. So talk a little bit about tendons. The job of a tendon is to attach a muscle to a bone. That's what a tendon does. Achilles tendon attaches the calf muscle uh, to the heel bone. Your rotator cuff tendons to tear your rotator cuff muscles to your arm bone. And if you look at how a tendon is constructed, it's made of all these individual fibers that are woven together, much like an electrical cable. The down process with tendons begins much like this. You have these individual collagen fibers and through repetitive abuse, get little micro injuries in, in them that we're not even aware of. And what these micro injuries do is that they heal up with scar tissue. That scar tissue doesn't have the same elasticity. It doesn't have the same strength. So as you do the same activity over and over and over, now instead of just getting individual fibers involved, you get more and more bundles involved. 
And when the tendon heals and that build up of scar tissue, it's called tendinosis. And if we look at a normal tendon over here, you see it has nice smooth sheets. The blood vessels are all very nicely organized. But when the tendon tries to heal itself up, it kind of does it in a, in a haphazard fashion. And what happens is those tiny little nerve endings, they get entrapped in that scar tissue. And that's what causes the pain when you have problems with your tendons, whether it's a rotator cuff, whether it's Achilles tendon, whether it's your plantar fascia. Uh, this is tendon that's falling apart, that's, that doesn't have a very good blood supply to it, and has a very limited capacity to heal on its own. So if you look at how tendinosis appears over a period of time, if this is the bone here and this is the tendon, the first thing that happens is you get to build up the scar tissue of tendinosis. doesn't have the same stretch, doesn't have the same strength, so eventually this clump of tendinosis will fail, and then it will start to pull off the bone where you get a partial thickness mm -hmm. tear. Or you can get a complete tear where you see the entire tendon pull yeah, away from the bone. And you can also get a tear where you get lengthwise tears going across the left side of the tendon called those longitudinal tears. So how do we treat osteoarthritis and tendinopathy with stem cells? First of all, let's talk about stem cells. Now, a mesenchymal stem cell is also known as an adult stem cell. These stem cells repair connective tissue, bone, muscle, tendon, ligaments. Mesenchymal stem cells will not repair heart tissue, lung tissue, liver tissue, organs like eyes. There are different types of stem cells that do that, and we don't use those in orthopedics. Stem cells are autologous, meaning they belong to you. These are not given to you by somebody else, so you don't have to worry about tissue rejection or tissue allergy, no risk of any sort of genetic transmission, and stem cells are basically our body's repair cells. In other words, any time you injure yourself, platelets and stem cells work together to heal that wound. So where do we get stem cells from? The most common source of mesenchymal stem cells are from the bone marrow. We can also get them from adipose tissue. There are some stem cells in muscle tissue, and there are also some stem cells that are attached to the circulation in the connective tissue around the joint, uh, and those are, those are called pericytes. And that's one of the reasons that we use platelets with stem cells to get those pericytes or stem cells that are attached to the blood vessels to be released into the circulation and help the tissue heal. So there's been a lot of questions about, well, which stem cells are best, bone marrow versus adipose? Okay, if you take the same amount of tissue, bone marrow versus fat tissue, you will actually have more stem cells per unit in fat than you do in bone marrow. But here's the issue. Stem cells from fat are mostly biologically inactive. And what I mean by that is our, our, our adipose tissue or our fat tissue is a connective tissue of sorts. In other words, there's connective tissues in those fat cells, and the stem cells are connected to that fat tissue, much like grapes on a vine. When you go to the grocery store and you buy grapes, for those stem cells to be activated, they have to go through a, a chemical process called SDR, which releases the stem cells from the fat tissue. The FDA says we are not, not allowed to do that in the United States, and we're shutting it down. So you will never have anyone in our practice or in most large practices across the country use this procedure to release stem cells from fat because the FDA will close your door. Now, there are some clinics where there may be one or two doctors and they have three or four employees. They may be doing this or rolling the dice, but most large practices will, will not do anything illegal. I know we won't do it here, okay? So... Are there any risks with the stem cell treatments? Okay, again, they belong to you, so you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about tissue allergy. Um, there's been now almost 15,000 studies done in the stem cell line. The FDA states in this country that we can use these cells as long as they're put back in the same patient the way we took them up. And when we take them out of your bone marrow and separate them from the bone marrow aspirin, we cannot culture them. In other words, in the rest of the world, culturing stem cells is an accepted practice, but the FDA says if I take your stem cells, 
and do anything chemically to it. Hello. I've got and my again, webinar on. Oh, okay. For osteoarthritis, they're talking about the stem cell stuff they're doing now. Mm-hmm. And Ma'am, can you mute yourself, please? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. And in terms of <laughs> you know, not, uh, adverse effects from the bone marrow <laughs> aspiration, uh, there's actually less with the mini liposucks or with the bone marrow aspiration than with liposuction. Okay. So talk about PRP. What is PRP? PRP is a concentration of platelets above baseline that we generally don't have, and sometimes we do have white cells in them. What is a platelet? Platelets are particles in our bloodstream that if we cut ourselves, not only stop the bleeding, but they help the tissue heal. So they are the body's first line of defense against injury, Plus, they're also Mother Nature's antibiotics, which is why most of the time when you cut yourself or you scrape your knee, you don't need to go on antibiotics because platelets are are anti-infective. And how do platelets work? Uh, And again, this is a slide. These little particles that you see in there, these little purple guys right here, those are the platelets. These are the white blood cells, and these are the red blood cells right here. So what platelets do is they release proteins into the circulation called growth factors. And what those growth factors do is they recruit stem cells and other molecules to the site of injury to help repair the tissue. So what they basically do in PRP is platelet-rich plasma. They kind of kickstart or accelerate the anti-inflammatory phase or the inflammatory phase of healing. It's red, it's swollen, it's hot. And the proliferative phase by releasing these growth factors and recruiting stem cells to the site of injury, and that is basically how our body heals itself. So when do we use stem cells and PRP? For tendon injuries, we mostly use PRP by itself. PRP can also be used to treat early osteoarthritis, and what I mean by that, I showed some slides earlier to show the cartilage on the end of the bone. Whatever room you're sitting on, there's probably some wall board in the room, If that is the cartilage and the stud behind the wall board is the bone, grade one cartilage loss is the little dink in the wall board. Grade two goes about a third of the way through, and grade three goes two-thirds of the way through, and grade four is down to the bone. So early osteoarthritis is grade one or two, and advanced osteoarthritis is mainly four with some three. Now, advanced osteoarthritis can be seen on an x-ray when you see those bone-on-bone changes. But a lot of times, if you have localized grade 4 where it's not the entire bone, uh, grade 3, especially specifically grade 1 and 2 as well, that's one reason we get MRI scans with osteoarthritis to actually see how much cartilage loss there is when it's not apparent by x-ray. And uh, PRP is used with stem cells to treat advanced osteoarthritis, and stem cells always work best when they're in the presence of PRP. So some tendon injuries may require both stem cells and PRP, and where we'll see that is, let's say the rotator cuff, one of the rotator cuff tendons is partially torn off the bone, but the majority of the tendon is still attached to the bone, and there may be some osteoarthritis in the joint. In that situation, we would use both the PRP and the stem cells to treat both the injured tendon and the osteoarthritis. And again, early osteoarthritis, PRP can be used alone. Advanced osteoarthritis stem cells with PRP, and PRP by itself really doesn't work for advanced osteoarthritis. And there's been numerous research papers across the world showing that. So how do we use stem cells and PRP to to treat osteoarthritis? The protocol that we use with Regenix is a three-part treatment. The first treatment is a prolotherapy treatment. What that involves is taking a highly concentrated dextrose solution. Dextrose is very similar to glucose, a naturally occurring carbohydrate produced and utilized by our body for energy, and inside a joint, the concentration is usually less than 1%. So when treating osteoarthritis, we use a 25% solution, which is a 2,500-fold increase in the concentration. And when we're treating the ligaments, 
around the joint that hold it together, we change the concentration to a, a little bit different number because tissues, again, respond differently because um, they're not the same. And what that prolotherapy treatment does, it kind of jump starts the healing process. Again, I showed you that slide before with, with, with the molecules inside the joint. What, what the prolotherapy does, the way I liken it, it's kind of like pushing the primer on your lawnmower before you start the engine. It's a wake-up call to the joint that it needs to get back to work. And usually within a day up to seven days later, we obtain the stem cells from the bone marrow, and we also are able to get PRP from the bone marrow, and we inject those into the joint as well as the surrounding connective tissue, whether it's a ligament or a meniscus that's been damaged, and we use the two together because PRP functions as a biologic project manager. And what I mean by that, the platelets will tell the stem cells what proteins to produce, uh, be it chondrocytes, uh, which are the, the cartilage cells or tendon cells. Um, they will also tell the stem cells to start dividing, and they will recruit more stem cells to the site of injury. So that's why they're used together in the protocol that we do. And then within seven days after that treatment, we Seven. give another PRP injection. And now what that third treatment does, it functions much like a booster to continue the process that was started a week before, or you can kind of look at it like putting fertilizer down on a newly seeded lawn. So um, typically these treatments are done within a period of about three weeks. We really don't want to wait more than seven days between treatments. Uh, but, but again, um, they can sometimes be done a couple days apart. And typically what we found when we're treating moderately to advanced osteoarthritis, um, it takes most folks about six to eight weeks to start noticing a difference in how they feel. Because again, this isn't a shot to take pain away as much as it is a treatment to stop the progression of the osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. And when I talked about the metabolic mess that's made inside the joint, there's a, it takes a while for that to be cleaned up. But usually, at six to eight weeks, you'll start getting some pain relief. Maybe you can, your, your pain is not as intense. You may be able to do more activity before your joint starts to bother you. If you do something to flare it up, uh, rather than taking you know, two weeks to cool down, it may cool down in a couple of days. But typically, once folks are about three to four months out, that's when say, okay, something's changed. My joint feels different. Um, and we used to tell folks about six months to a year to get as good as you're going to get, but ongoing research with, uh, over the last five years, with 2018 being year six, shows that this is a lasting effect. In other words, if folks have a positive response 12 months out, they will be doing as good or better for up to five years out. And the caveat or the thing that you have to remember is you always want the repair process to outpace the breakdown process. And no one or nothing is going to tell you that better than your affected joint. In other words, if you have an osteoarthritic knee or you have an osteoarthritic hip, you need to be active. It's important to be active. But the key is you don't want to go out of your way on purpose to do things that increase your pain while you're doing the activity or afterward, because if you do that on a regular basis, you're letting all those degenerative um, and inflammatory substances take over in the joint again. So the key is be active, but don't go out of your way looking for pain. We, physical therapy is very important. Uh, number one, to maintain or regain motion that's been lost, to get muscle strength back. And if you're involved with the lower extremity, you also want to get your balance strength back. And what I mean by that is we have position sensors in our joints that tell our brain where we are when we're moving around in time. In other words, let's say you want to cross a creek and you see the three stones that you're going to step on to get to the other side. Well, you're not thinking I have to flex my hip 90 degrees, extend my knee 30, rotate my foot 20. Your body and your brain already know how to do that. But once you've had significant osteoarthritis in a joint, those little position sensors that we have in our joint they need to be re-educated and retrained. And that's very important, especially uh, when you have to be on one leg. And when are you on one leg? Usually going up and down the stairs. Oftentimes, that's one of the biggest fears that elderly folks have, 
boy, I have this bad hip, I have this bad knee, I'm going to fall down the stairs. So physical therapy is very important in terms of getting that balance strength back after you've had treatment. Uh, many times, depending on where the osteoarthritis is located, uh, it will sometimes necessitate wearing a, a brace for the knee, uh, sometimes a brace for an ankle, sometimes a brace for a thumb or wrist. Usually shoulders, so we, we like to, you know, shoulders are joints that they like to move as quick as soon as possible because if they're not moved, they tend to freeze down and lose motion. And there's also certain medications that need to be discontinued prior to getting these treatments because many of these medications can keep the stem cells and or platelets from working. So we go through all of that with you if this is something that a, a patient is interested in doing. Uh, if we're using PRP for tendons, the protocol that we use is we do the first two treatments about four weeks apart. We know, again, it takes about six to eight weeks to notice any pain relief. And we see folks back about six weeks after they've had their second treatment. Let's say we're treating an Achilles tendon or a rotator cuff tear. And if people feel like they're making progress in the weeks that passes, we would probably yeah. go after a third treatment. Again, you know what most anti-inflammatory medicines, most anti-inflammatory medicines such as aspirin, ibuprofen, need to be stopped prior to treatment for about seven days, and it can be restarted afterward. But anti-inflammatory medicines such as aspirin, Aleve, ibuprofen, they keep platelets from working. Corticosteroids. Uh, if you get a corticosteroid injection in a joint, we can't treat you for, for 12 weeks because corticosteroids, while they are good for pain and inflammation, they're catabolic, meaning they break tissue down. In other words, when athletes take steroids, they take anabolic steroids. They have the opposite effect. They get you stronger. They get you quicker. They help you heal faster. But in most states, it's illegal to provide, uh, prescribe any sort of anabolic steroid. Corticosteroids, in other words, they break tissue down. They're like putting water on a fire. They put out the fire, and you're left with the burnt wood. And there's been good studies shown. This has been shown in the rheumatology literature, where if you take two groups of patients that start with the same amount of osteoarthritis, group A gets corticosteroid injections, and group B does not, group A usually gets their joint replacement three to five years sooner than the folks that never received corticosteroid injections. And again, uh, corticosteroid uh, also need to be avoided when taken orally, and it, it's one of those medicines that needs to be discontinued um, prior to treatment. Otherwise, the treatment has a very low success rate. So do stem cells regenerate new cartilage? That's the question everybody wants to know, okay? And I'm going to just show you these pictures here because I've come across these in ads, uh, in magazines, on the internet, where these places show these remarkable changes in x-rays, like you see here on the, on the left with the hip joint, and like you see over here on the right, and also down here uh, on the bottom. Now, this one here, they status post SCVS, so these people got fat cells in their knees. So the only way you get these x-rays here, okay, is A, they are not the same patient's x-rays, or you can change the x-ray beam when you want to do the before and after picture. So in other words here, if this x-ray beam is coming in straight perpendicular to the bone and the cartilage is worn off, you're going to get a picture that looks like this, but you can angle the x-ray 20 or 30 degrees, and that completely changes the way the x-ray looks. I've been practicing medicine for 30 years. I have never seen this in my practice or anybody else's practice that I'm aware of that is practicing orthopedic medicine because this, at least short term, doesn't happen. Now, if you're 40 years old and you get a stem cell treatment and we take an x-ray 20 years ago, yeah, that, much, that might change. But basically what happens in most folks that have moderately advanced to advanced osteoarthritis, we are stopping this process right here. We are arresting or stopping the osteoarthritic process. In other words, once this process has stopped, the osteoarthritis has no further progression. 
unless, like we said before, if you constantly do things that make your knee hurt. So let's say you have advanced osteoarthritis and you get this treatment and you decide you're going to go out and run every day and every day you go out and run, your knee hurts for four hours afterward, it's like a balloon. No, these guys are going to take over and the treatment's not going to work. But basically what happens is if we stop this process here and keep the osteoarthritis from progressing, what we term a positive result is a decrease in pain, an increase in function, and not needing to get a joint replacement or a major operation. In other words, if you take folks that have moder you know, moderate to advanced osteoarthritis, and let's say you take 100 people that have had a positive response, and you get MRI scans a couple of years later, and, and let's say, you know, for the folks that are over 50, maybe 15 or 20 percent of those will have regenerated new cartilage on the end of the bone. What about those other 80 percent that are feeling just as well as the 20 percent that have shown some cartilage while they have not necessarily shown cartilage regrowth on an MRI scan? What the MRI scan will often show is that the arthritis has not progressed. So once you stop this process right here of the cartilage breakdown causing the pain and inflammation, people's joints will feel better and they function better. But in the great majority of people who have some of those x-rays that I showed you before, we're probably not going to see new cartilage growth. It's stopping the process. In other words, if you grew up in the Great Lakes, where salt is thrown on your car winter after winter, let's say you buy a new car and you get a little dent in the fender, now there's a little rust spot. Salt gets thrown on it winter after winter after winter, now that rust spot can become a big rust hole. But let's say you're, the first year you have that car, you get a little ding in it, there's some rust, and you move to Arizona where there's no salt being thrown on the car, that rust hole is never going to, that rust spot's never going to get bigger, and it's going to stop progressing. Now, if you take folks that are in their teens or 20s, young athletes who maybe have a piece of cartilage knocked off at the end of the bone, and you take an X-ray or an MRI scan a couple of years later, oftentimes those MRI scans look dramatically different, but that is more localized osteoarthritis and advanced osteoarthritis. Because that is one of the questions people ask most, am I going to grow new cartilage? So why use the Regenix protocol? The PRP that we use is not coming from a commercial kit that's fun in a machine. We customize the PRP based on what we are treating. In other words, we talked about PRP as being in, an increased concentration in platelets. When we treat osteoarthritis, we generally get that concentration of platelets about 16 to 20 times normal, which if you put that high a concentration in in a tendon, it would keep the tendon cells from growing. It's too concentrated. If you took a low concentration of PRP four times and put it inside a joint, it wouldn't help the osteoarthritis very much, but it would help the tendon. So you have to know what you're treating, and you have to be able to alter the concentration of the PRP. The way we do stem cells and the lab methods that we use uh, give much higher numbers and yields of viable stem cells. The other thing is that I, I found very important that Regenix has full-time cell biologists and biochemists and folks that are publishing research paper and giving us new in, in clinical information that we can use when we treat patients. In other words, about three or four years ago, if people came in with osteoarthritis in two major joints, be it two hips, two knees, or two shoulders, and those joints were treated at the same time, the results weren't nearly as good because in the great majority of patients, we can't get enough stem cells to treat two large osteoarthritic joints at the same time. And without tracking the outcomes like we do, we would never know that. And again, this is probably the most important reason. I, I started doing biologics 11 years ago, and we've seen a lot of people respond and some people don't respond. There's people out there that say, you're selling snake oil. Other people say this is the best thing since sliced bread. And unless you track the outcome of every patient that you're treating, you really don't know how they're doing. You can't make the claim if you don't track the outcomes. And what you, what, how we track outcomes is that if you decide you're going to get a knee or a hip or a shoulder treated, 
you fill out about a 10 minute questionnaire prior to treatment and ask you how your joint functions. And then after treatment, you get that sort of survey in a condensed form, much like a survey monkey on a monthly basis. And that's how we track people out over a period of years. So based on the information that we're getting from the patient registry, that allows us to tell whether you're an excellent, good, fair, or poor candidate. And this is based on where you have the osteoarthritis, which joint it is, what part of the joint, how much osteoarthritis you have, your overall medical history, what we find on physical exam, and what the imaging shows. So based on that, um, we can tell you, you know, at least what we know in 2018 is this is a treatment that has a good chance, a fair chance, or a poor chance of helping you. Most people that want these treatments aren't very good candidates because the osteoarthritis has progressed too far. And if a joint, you know, for instance, for a hip joint, if, 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 if people have lost range of motion where it's almost impossible for them to put their socks and shoes on um, or they can't cross their legs or with a knee, if their knee can't straighten out fully, for instance, those are some things there that say, well, you're probably not a very good candidate. On the other hand, if you're, you know, the data has also shown that you can take someone that's elderly and if they have full range of motion, in that knee joint or that ankle joint or that wrist joint, they're going to do better than someone half their age that's already lost motion. And again, that's, that's why we have outcomes that track the data. So what about these amniotic and umbilical cord cells? In the last number of months, the FDA has really clamped down and shut down a lot of clinics across the country because they're advertising that these products contain live stem cells but they do not, okay? Cord blood or umbilical cord blood is only, is, the, is only approved by the FDA for what's called hemopoietic stem cell transportation or transplantation. That's for procedures like leukemia and lymphoma. The FDA says the only live cells that are indicated for orthopedic applications are from the bone marrow or from the fat and we already talked about the advantages of the bone marrow over the fat, okay? So what do these products contain? They're actually, you know, they, they have some pretty good stuff in them. They have many of the same growth factors and proteins that are found in PRP, um, they, but they also have growth factors and unique, uh, growth factors and other proteins that are unique to the different parts of the placenta. And they do have a role in place in regenerative medicine but they certainly do not contain stem cells, okay? And what some of these companies are doing now is they're counting these as stem cell recruiters. But if you remember what we talked about PRP, that's exactly what PRP does. So there's chiropractors, uh, um, you know, giving these shots, charging outrageous amounts of money because we've had patients tell us uh, these people are being told that they're getting stem cells, but if you sign up today without any sort of physical physical exam or MRI scan or any medical history, I uh, do it today, we'll give you a good price. And, and the FDA is catching on to that. And again, these are some of the, the, the more common products uh, that are out there. Amniofix, BioRestore, Flowgraft, Ovation, these are all um, uh, products from the placenta, okay? And if you look at the slides over here, this is done by flow cytometry. And basically what that means it follows these cells as they grow and divide, okay? So if you have live stem cells, you should see this gray area here and here. But if you don't have any live stem cells, like these products do not, you're gonna see this blank box in there, okay? So again, Amniofix is one product that never claimed, uh, the manufacturer never claimed that it had stem cells in it, nor did the reps that come and call on physicians that, and, and, but these other products have uh, said that they got live stem cells in them, but this has not only been reproduced at the Interventional Orthopedic Foundation at Colorado State University, it's also been reproduced in other labs across the country. And again, they do have some potential to help with pain and inflammation, but no one has done outcomes. There's some double blind studies going on right now that are about two years out that they do show promise, but again, understand if you're being told these products have stem cells in them, uh, that is a false claim. 
So what some of the companies are doing, if you look at Renew Stem, you'll see that the word stem cell has been taken out and they use the term regenerative cell, okay? Um, other things to look out here, okay? You look here at this ad here uh, about how patients are getting real relief and they're getting it done, but I mean, what reason do you have in your ad here to say there's no dead babies involved? I mean, what, what is that ad all about? And this is something that's been shared on here locally in Cincinnati on the websites and in the newspaper. Um, you have to be very, very careful. And what you have to be most careful about, if you look at this company right here, okay, and look at all the things they are treating. They are treating anti-aging. They're treating Lou Gehrig's disease. They're treating multiple sclerosis. They're treating autism. They are treating lupus. These guys are brilliant. I mean, that they can treat every body part with a relatively new treatment successfully with these wonderful results, I, I, I have no answer because I've been practicing orthopedics for 30 years and I have a heck of a time keeping up with everything in my practice that involves orthopedics, much less being able to treat lupus with stem cells or treating multiple sclerosis or treating Parkinson's disease or lung disease. So if you see if you see ads like this run for the hills, in fact, this is one of the, this, this a, a, a clinic down in Florida was using stem cells to treat macular degeneration. Three of the people they treated went instantly blind. So that's why the FDA is good and bad. In other words, they, you know, clinics like this, you know, need, need to, you know, they, they can harm people. But if you see this here, and a clinic is treating more than one um, body system in their clinic. I mean, anti-aging and Lou Gehrig's disease and lupus all under the same roof. Yeah, that, those are some very, very good doctors. Uh, I'm being facetious there. So I'm going to stop yakking here, and I'm going to kind of open up this up to questions. Uh, so feel free to start talking. I'm done, and I'll, I'll field all questions here. I have a question. So what's the ballpark cost for a knee to be treated with it, it stem depends. cells? It depends what, what part of your knee is getting treated and how much you're getting treated. So typically, um, those, those, those treatments run, you know, the three-part treatment that we talked about, the prolotherapy treatment, the second treatment with the stem cells and the PRP, and the third treatment with the PRP, runs roughly around $6,000, give or take a few hundred dollars e either way. Okay. And the insurance is still not covering that typically, correct? They are not covering, they're not even CPT codes for them. In other words, what a CPT code is. I know what that is. is yeah, you get, yeah. There, there's no CPT codes. I mean, where a lot of people, um, and we, we've been doing this for a long period of time, and what will often happen is a patient will call their insurance company and they ask the insurance company, will you cover stem cells? And usually you have, you know, someone answering the phone that, you know, looks up and says, oh, yeah, we cover stem cells. And usually it's covered for leukemia, lymphomas, those sort of things. So um, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, if you ask the insurance company, they cover, will you cover mesenchymal stem cells for orthopedic injuries, they won't even have a classification for that. So the answer is no. Okay, thank you. Dr. Stein? Yes, sir. Um, I think what I heard you say is depending on the degree of uh, arthritis, that could mean either PRP by itself, if it's moderate to significant, I guess, it, would, it could mean PRP plus some stuff. Right. Uh, Usually, just, they, again, if you use the you know grade one and grade two osteoarthritis using the analogy of the wall board, where it's just a little dink in there, it maybe goes a third away through. PRP has been shown to work fairly well for that. Now, if you start getting grade three changes, um, especially where the bone sits on top of each other, and certainly grade four that involve the whole compartment, that's when you need to use both. But again. Sometimes osteoarthritis can be localized to one small area. It's a, you know, sometimes what can happen is you can have a three by four millimeter area of cartilage loss that's grade four, but the rest of the joint is fine and there's no meniscal injuries. 
in that sort of situation, PRP may work. So that's why it's important when it's not clear by looking at an X-ray that you get an MRI scan because you can't you can't quantitate how much cartilage loss there is on a plain X-ray unless it's very advanced. And then you then you know a first year medical student can tell you that. Thank you. Yes, sir. I don't want to ask you too many questions. No, you, I'm, 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 I, I, I am in no rush, sir. I got, I, I got a nice cup of cold water here. I'll talk all night. <laughs> well, you, I, I don't, I don't want to take the uh, because uh, it would be more questions, and I, I'm going to see you next week. So okay, okay. I want, I, I'll spare, I'll spare you of my personal <laughs> situation right now. Anyway, I understand. Dr. Stein, could you do a subchondral injection on knees with this? Well, what we do with that, again, we look at the MRI scan, and we, we do under guidance, and depending on where that subchondral lesion is, uh, we can sometimes get at it with the needle with ultrasound, but depending, there's, there's some areas where if it's in the subchondral bone and it's diffuse and you can't get it with a needle under ultrasound, um, that sometimes there are surgeons uh, that are starting to do these procedures in the arthroscope. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I, I appreciate everyone listening in, and you have a good evening. Thank, uh, thanks for doing this, Dr. Stein. It was very helpful. My pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. welcome.